So um, this is kind of tradition for us where we basically you know, have been doing these kind of TOC meetings at KubeCon as just a way to, you know, introduce kind of how the TOC works. You know, there aren't these people that are just magically hiding and, and all this wonderful stuff. It's an open, open process and so on. So generally we'll go through kind of like a brief intro of, you know, how the TOC works, then open up for questions uh, and kind of see where things go from there. So, you know, you know, saw this a little bit, you know, today, you know, CNCF is all about kind of making cloud native computing uh, ubiquitous and the TOC is basically there to kind of guide the technical side uh, of the organization, ensuring that projects are, you know, you know, essentially cultivated, you know, accepted and kind of guiding them through that wonderful, um, you know, process. We have 11 lovely, you know, individuals. Unfortunately, uh, just two of us uh, were able to join uh, today and, you know, I'll have them kind of maybe introduce them and introduce themselves and talk a little bit about kind of your background and, and, and what you work on. And then we'll kind of go through our journey of how the TOC operates um, for about 10 minutes and then maybe open it up for, for questions for folks. Um, and if we end early and go to the party, even better. So <laughs> go ahead and maybe Cornelia, you start first. And sure. Um, so Cornelia Davis, um, I have spent the last 10 years working in developer platforms, initially with Cloud Foundry, and then about five or six years ago, started getting involved in Kubernetes, still working at Pivotal at the time, um, partnering with VMware. Um, and, uh, and then Heptio came into VMware and so got, had a chance to partner with people like Joe Bita and um, Craig McLucky as well. Uh, so I've been doing Kubernetes for about five or six years, and then I spent about 18 months at Weaveworks, which is the company that coined the term GitOps, which is really kind of an extension of DevOps for a platform like, like Kubernetes. And very recently, um, just in the last two or three months, I have joined Amazon. All right. Should we remove the mask? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, we we're, can. I'm okay with it. I'm cool with it, too. Yeah, okay. So I'm Ricardo, I'm a computing engineer at CERN in Geneva. Um, I work on our cloud deployments. We run a large private cloud uh, on-premises. And we also use public clouds. Um, I'm mostly focusing on Kubernetes and containerized environments, but I do also a lot of networking and software-defined networks, and uh, more recently, some machine learning. Uh, to support our scientists, uh, so a lot of accelerators and integrating all of this in Kubernetes. Uh, before that, I did uh, different other things in at CERN as well. I was a developer for uh, what we call our uh, worldwide LHC computing grid, which is a kind of large distributed environment that is uh, pre-cloud, uh, something that would be very different if it would be redesigned today, but uh, that puts a lot of resources at the disposal of our scientists. Yeah, and uh, more recently I started uh, working on the CNCF uh, research and user group, which kind of tries to get together all the members um, of uh, end users of the CNCF that has have similar requirements uh, regarding batch like workloads and accelerators. And uh, yeah, and since uh, February this year, I'm in the TOC uh, as an end user representative. So um, I help out in this area. And I guess Chris Anizik, I have the fun job of serving as CTO of the org, and my team basically supports the TOC and kind of our technical side uh, of the house and ensure our projects are healthy and, uh, and stable. So governance structure, you know, we'll kind of go through and talk a little bit of how we're governed because a lot of people kind of get this kind of, you know, confused. I think it's a little bit of, you know, inside baseball, but I think it's kind of important to understand how the organization actually runs. So we have kind of three main um, you know, parts of CNCF, you know, we have the governing board who basically these are your essentially funders, right? You know, these are the people that are members of the organization, they pay in, that money is basically pulled together to go sustain the project. These people who are on the governing board generally have no say in how the technical projects work. They're just there to come together and decide how the budget is spent. So we could basically put on wonderful, wonderful events like this, like KubeCon or fund security audits and so on. So, um, you know, it's, it's mostly vendors, but there are a mix of end users like, you know, Apple and Spotify, part of um, the governing board. The TOC, you know, which is here, this is the technical body. It's a completely separate, you know, organization, um, you know, from the governing board. Um, it handles all the technical decisions, which projects get accepted, which projects, you know, get archived. And we purposely separate, you know, the governing board, the funding structure 
from the technical decision. So, you know, the way we think about it is it is not a kind of, it, it is it's not like a pay to play model, it's a pay to sustain. So all technical decisions are not influenced from the funders of the organization. They may employ some of these individuals, but you know, it is the maintainers at the end of the day and the TOC who make the uh, you know, technical decisions um, you know, overall. And then we have a third kind of structure, the end user community, which essentially is end user organizations, people who don't sell cloud native you know, services or, or products, right? These are the actual consumers of the technology like, a, like an Apple or a CERN where Ricardo uh, works for and AWS as, as a vendor. We give a special space for the end user community to basically work together, collaborate, share practices, and essentially, uh, safe space may not be the right word, but it's basically it's an area for them to essentially not have vendors involved. But they have a formal role in governance, so end users get to elect people on the TOC and they have representation there. And so these are kind of the three main tier structure uh, of CNCF, you know, for us that kind of work in the organization, it's very obvious, but a lot of people sometimes get confused that like, oh, do people like pay to get a TOC seat or how does this work? And if it's like, it's completely separate, you know, on, on purpose. We kind of separate technical governance from funding governance, which people get a little bit confused by. And we also give end users a special voice um, in, in the organization. So one of the things that TOC puts together is something we call the TOC, you know, principles. These are essentially things that the TOC kind of abides by and kind of, you know, their decision, you know, how they think about making, um, you know, decisions. So this was put together, you know, a while ago by some of the early TOC members, but generally we consider the CNCF as a kind of project-centric organization. If you notice that, you know, if you're older at KubeCon, there's project logos all over the place. Projects are, for, you know, first and foremost, you know, uh, you know, at the center, less so of the organization. Um, projects are self-governing. Um, you know, one thing a lot of people, you know, coming from different foundations and organizations get a little bit confused is each project gets to kind of build their own governance model of how they run. You know, Kubernetes is very different from an Envoy than a Containerd, than a Linkerd, um, uh, and so on. And we just find that as a, a convenient way where each project's gonna be different, they should be governed a little bit different. It just has to be documented in public. Um, the TOC looks for very high quality, high velocity, generally projects. You know, that's kind of what they generally look for. Sometimes they make bets. We have this kind of no kingmakers rule. We allow for competing and overlapping projects. If you notice, we have things like Containerd and Creo, Linkerd and Envoy. All these things kind of overlap and compete in some way. We don't mean to like pick a project and have that one be like the only one true way uh, to do things. We do allow for uh, competition. We're not a traditional standards body. We don't basically deal with old school standards. Sometimes we have specifications, but the idea is we only promote technology or, or specifications that actually have real world um, usage um, and, and so on. So um, there's some other things you know here that we kind of talk about, but overall the whole mission of the organization, put projects first, project centrics, and above all, just like help projects become you know, better. Um, you know, maturity models, uh, we have three main levels of, you know, projects that the TOC kind of works with and kind of decides where to guide projects through. Sandbox, incubating, graduate are the three main levels. We kind of use that crossing the chasm analogy. I'm, you know, Cornelia talked about this a little bit, but essentially, you know, sandbox projects, these are like early stage projects. We kind of expect them potentially to either be successful or die. There's no guarantees. Incubating things are a little bit more mature, and we you know make a little bit more guarantees there. And then graduated are projects that like your company should be able to bet on with no concerns or worries. And there's a whole kind of process that guide these uh, projects through this um, potential um, you know maturity uh, set of levels. Um, a lot of time when we do these meetings, people are asking like, how do I get a project in? Like you know how does this work? It's a fairly simple you know process that you know I'll give a lot of credit to the TOC that they spend a lot of time kind of iterating and optimizing this. Sometimes it's to people's, like maybe like, some, some people get a little upset because you know sometimes it takes a while to evolve process when you have all these different organizations and members kind of working together, but there's a fairly simple process. Um, sandbox is very easy generally to kind of get into. There's certain kind of qualifications that you have to meet as part of the sandbox application, uh, and they're generally reviewed on a one to two months uh, basis, but it's meant to be kind of very lightweight, we don't do a lot of marketing support for sandbox projects, but the goal is to kind of make it easy to kind of get in and get cultivated within the organization. Incubation and graduation, the bar is significantly higher. Um, you know, our TOC members basically 
interview end users, they do due diligence, reviews. It's a very kind of in-depth process if you've ever kind of seen it publicly. And the, and the best part about this, it's all documented publicly on GitHub. None of this is done uh, in private, um, you know, uh, at all. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into this in, in detail because I think Cornelia did a fantastic job of talking about the tags if you attended um, keynotes. But essentially what we've done is as the CNCF has grown into over 100 projects, um, it's just very hard to potentially have just a TOC focus and support all of them. So we broke up into different kind of focus areas based on what people were interested in. So we have things that cover security, storage, runtime, observability, and so on. It's all broken apart, you know, based on what people, you know, care about and focus on. These tags basically serve as kind of an advisory function. They help the TOC with potentially reviews and provide input based on their kind of specialties. Because not everyone in the TOC may be an expert on, say, observability. And this has kind of helped us scale um, as an organization. It has been super, uh, I think, useful uh, from my perspective. So um, I'm going to kind of, uh, you know, go through uh, I'm going to kind of skip and gloss over the, you know, tags. If people have any particular questions on each of these things, we're happy to kind of go through them. But I think Cornelia did a good job kind of covering some of these in the keynote, which uh, is also online. Um, you know, I think really, you know, we kind of want to treat this as more of kind of an interactive, um, you know, discussion. I have a couple questions for the TOC, mostly around, you know, what they kind of see for the future of, of, you know, CNCF in terms of which projects that we may be potentially interested in doing or kind of what we want to support in the future. But I truly kind of want to open it up uh, to folks that may have uh, questions, um, you know, out there. But, um, you know, so let's basically, um, I'll start with a question kind of regarding, you know, um, you know, kind of the future and what people think about that. And then maybe we kind of open it up to the audience to see if there's any kind of questions or, you know, uh, process concerns and so on. But, you know, the whole idea is to make this kind of an open and uh, discussion to get input from the community and help us evolve and become a better organization. So, you know, question to our, our, our lovely two, two TOC members. Um, so, you know, we've grown from, you know, one project from Kubernetes to kind of, you know, that was kind of our kernel, and we've expanded to, you know, nearly 120 projects that cover all kind of aspects. You know, do you, you know, do you, like, what do you think is potentially, you know, missing, you know, in that, like, landscape of projects that, you know, we need to kind of, you know, potentially seek or go after or you know maybe you have from your end experience working with you know customers or end users or from actually you know usage within your organization what do you think kind of holes are are missing currently um you know in kind of the large landscape that we've built out in this organization over the last six years anyone want to take that one yeah, first? I, mean, I think we talked about this recently um and i'm trying to remember what we talked about then but i certainly have you know s some thoughts along those lines I think that um, one of the areas, if I recall correctly, that we talked about was um, be, it really tracks against what's happening in the industry as a whole. And one of those things, of course, is more and more, di more, and more distribution. And I'm talking about the edge. Um, and yeah, we have just the beginnings of some of those things. So we have some Kubernetes projects that are small footprint that are designed to go into these small devices and things like that. But I think that there's still an awful lot that's missing to bring all of that together. Um, so there's certainly room for, for projects that address the integration problem, the, the, the distributed protocols and things like that. I think that's one of the areas for sure. Yeah, so um, maybe, maybe also because of my background, I think one area that uh, is also kind of interesting is all the ML machine learning things. Yep. So a lot of projects uh, around, but uh, it's it's not really clear where they fit. Uh, even if we go to the tags, uh, when we start reviewing machine learning projects, it's it's like do we go runtime or which which advisory group uh, fits the best? Because it kind of covers a lot of things. Uh, I think that area will also be quite important. And the other the other part is this ten, uh, trend to to manage things that are not necessarily related to containers uh, within the, this uh, kind of cloud native world, integrating resources like projects like Crossplane, what they are trying to do, all this kind of uh, bringing to, to, to this ecosystem things that are were not uh, traditionally seen as being part of it. I think this will be also be a trend. Uh, so I don't know how this will follow up, but I think it's something we should focus on. 
Is there anything else, like particularly from you know, uh, you, you work basically at a research lab, right? You know, I remember back in the university, we like working on things like Slurm and using yeah. that. Like, it's a whole like, if you ever attend, you know, an HPC conference like Supercomputer, it seems like a whole weird parallel universe of folks that are doing distributed computing yeah. at scale and have been doing it for a while. And then you come to KubeCon, and it's like there's all these folks in industry kind of doing similar things, and it feels like these people just aren't talking to each other. Yeah, this is something that we, we also deal internally because uh, as the trend goes to, to running things on Kubernetes, then why not do all the rest as well if we have all the experience and knowledge on it. Uh, there are some barriers that are more technical. Uh, things like uh, there, there's a lot of efforts with things like rootless containers to run like in HPC environments, which are kind of more, uh, I, I don't know, more tight in, in comparison to, to what we do elsewhere. And other things like uh, fair share, uh, uh, more advanced scheduling uh, in, in these tools. These are all things that are ongoing. I saw a couple of talks actually here at KubeCon um, related to advanced scheduling, adding things like uh, um, fairness and uh, better priority definitions on scheduling. So this this is coming. I don't know. I don't know how much will be like in the core of something like Kubernetes or or uh, other projects that will will be plugged in. But there's a place. Um, Rootless is very interesting because it touches the, the whole stack. The people working on it go from the kernel all the way to the end user tools. So it's pretty interesting. Which scares me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think what you're talking about, what I think is really interesting in this HPC space is that um, the, there's all sorts of protocols in place for being able to treat this highly distributed system, which we have to have because we need it for scale, as a single system. Mm -hmm. and and most of what we do when we still talk about Kubernetes is we talk about scheduling things on a cluster. But what happens now when we yeah. need to schedule our HPC workloads across clusters and maintain state across those? It's it's a it's a yeah. significant distributed systems problem. There was there was a big push towards federation, and now kind of uh, because some efforts were not so successful, we start looking more at multi-cluster and maybe doing things differently. So it's, yeah. it's an interesting change yeah. yeah definitely like if you ever have attended kind of both events it's just so strange it's like literally <laughs> parallel world worlds that just don't talk to each yeah. uh, other as, as as much so what kind of one more question uh before we kind of turn over to the audience and so one one theme that has kind of come up in this conference at least that i've been you know talking to a lot of you know, and users and, and even vendors, this whole notion of like security seems to be top of mind for for everyone, right? You know, securing the supply chain definitely seems to be a theme. You know, from your perspective on, on the TOC, do you see, you know, what are your thoughts of how we can enable projects, you know, within our ecosystem to be potentially more successful, you know, at this? What can we kind of do to kind of improve the situation? Because we, we do have some practices in place, we do some security audits, but it just feels, you know, we have our own set of projects in CNCF, the 120 or so, but then all those 120 or so projects depend on, you know, tens of thousand dependencies that have different, you know, levels of, of security and something, you know, I think about now on, on probably like a daily basis and definitely it's kind of permeated a, a portion, um, you know, of, 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 of this conference. Yeah, I mean, one, the first thing I would say is, of course, there's the security of security audits of the projects that, that we have within the CNCF. But um, I just actually attended the pancake breakfast this morning, and the topic was security there. And what, what is so interesting is that I think that the whole security space, um, in general, the way that enterprises are still thinking about it is they have built these really rigorous models around the old architectures. And, um, and they're not quite, they haven't quite come along for the ride yet. And so I think that we need to do a whole heck of a lot more to go back and not express the requirements via the solutions that we've had in place for the last 10 or 20 years, but go back and revisit those requirements and look at the new architecture because most of the solutions are based on those old architectures. And so now we have these new surface areas how do you inject um, security into a convergent system? How do you make security something that's convergent? Um, how do you audit when things are constantly changing? Security used to have this notion of, well, we're gonna get everything super stable and then we're not gonna change it and that's how we're gonna ensure security. But now, what does security mean in a constantly changing world? 
Um, and so I think, I think that that's one area where we can certainly do an awful lot. I had posed the question this morning of Kubernetes, be, I, and again, convergence is one of my favorite words in cloud native because in distributed systems, that is the pattern that works. And that's why Kubernetes, one of the reasons why Kubernetes got so ubiquitous is because it, it changed the fundamental model to this model of convergence. And it has a language for the de de declared, the desired state. What is the language for various elements of security? And what are those convergence mechanisms? And not all of those convergence mechanisms are gonna be in a platform like Kubernetes. What happens when you start doing security as a part of your build pipeline? How do you do that from a convergence perspective? So I think there's an awful lot that we need to do in the security space that is a good call out. So, you know, I'm happy now, I think, to kind of turn over maybe the audience for some questions. There's basically a few kind of wrap up things in terms of, you know, I, I just want to make sure people are aware that TOC generally is very open for people coming in. I know sometimes people new to the community get a little bit, uh, you know, they, they, they get a little bit worried sometimes. Oh, I don't know if I can approach them. I, I guarantee you, if you kind of reach out to folks, everyone is very welcome. They may be, may be a little bit busy, uh, but overall, everyone's kind of open and, and you know, willing to kind of help out uh, as, as, as time uh, allots. One important thing to note is I, I do want to kind of encourage folks that we do have elections basically coming up in 2022. That should say 2022 instead of 2021. But, you know, we're going through this whole process where, you know, we're looking for people that are more senior engineers, generally you have some cloud native experience. Uh, could work in end user communities, could, you know, doesn't have to work for an end user, but just generally has some experience. And we just, we want to encourage more folks to run from all different backgrounds, different representations, because I think one of the, the best things that we've done with the TOC over time is we've expanded it to include more end user representation, more people from different backgrounds. And I think that's just very healthy, um, you know, to, to have. So um, with, with that said, um, you know, our, Love, love to take any questions from the audience. Chris, Otherwise, if, if I could, yeah, before sure. we take the question, I just want to add a little something to the that you said there. Yeah. I'm going to make it very personal. So I, I also joined the TOC earlier this year, and I wanted to share with you a little bit about how that process went for me, because I think it might just help encourage some of you to step forward. So Liz Rice, our, um, our chair, TOC chair, pinged me one day and said, hey, have you ever thought about running for the TOC? And I said, oh, I totally want to run for the TOC someday when I'm ready. And she said, um, you're the CTO of WeaveWorks. You wrote a book on cloud native patterns. You're ready. And I was like, really? And she said, yeah, you're ready. And that's how I came to do it. So for all of you who are thinking, ah, I would love to do that someday. I'm not ready. There's a really good chance that you are ready and step forward or work with somebody to step forward. And if it doesn't work the first time, that's okay too. But I just really want to encourage all of you because most of you probably think that you're not ready, but you are. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic story. Liz, our, our fearless, our fearless TOC chair. <laughs> <laughs> we miss her. She so I wants know. to be here. I know. But we'll eventually work. open up in November. Yep. So. <laughs> Um, so any questions in the audience before we kind of wrap things? So we got two hands at I've, least. I've got questions Three. from online first, uh, so we'll answer those Let's and then we'll go to in person. So uh, first we've got what criteria are used by the technical oversight committee to select the tag chairs? Mm. Good question. I, I can certainly answer that. So the TOC itself does not choose the tag chairs, we approve them. And I can't think of a single instance where we haven't. Um, it's the tag chairs are nominated and, and selected by the tags themselves. And um, in virtually every case, it's the, they make the decision be, based on somebody who's been already contributing to the tag and has been involved in the tag. Um, and ha shows the passion for the charter that the tag has, and they bring them forward. And just as a, as a point of governance, um, in case there is some kind of conflict, uh, that's the, really the role that the TOC would play. But as Chris said, um, even when it comes to governance, that whole process, the, it, by design, there's, it's a whole bunch of autonomy is yeah. built into those. So we are the TOC that approve things, but... Yeah. 
things work pretty well. So just like our projects are self-governing, the yep. tags are essentially self-governing and kind of go through things. And you know, there's pros and cons to that approach. I, some days I regret it, but I do think it makes us a little bit stronger and resilient as an organization for that yep. particular flexibility. Cool. Uh, what about being on the on the TOC has surprised you, has most surprised you. Do you have a favorite part of your job on the TOC? And by the way, the previous question was from Kathy, um, and um, this question is from Amy. Amy, uh, Amy from, uh, Amy, yeah. Oh, our Amy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, is yeah. also, by the way, absolutely, <laughs> insanely yeah. fabulous. We could not do any of what we do without Amy, so. Yeah, that's my, well, I, I can try. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think what surprised me the most is um, how, how open it is, actually. Uh, like even, even the meetings we have between us, uh, everyone comes from like very different backgrounds and, and companies and everything, but like when, when it, in the meetings, the, you don't see it. It's, uh, it's really a nice team of uh, people um, with very different backgrounds. And the, my favorite thing is really how much I learn uh, because um, we, we cover issues that touch areas that uh, I don't deal with uh, daily or even yearly. Uh, and I learn a lot. And uh, I try to bring this back also to, to my colleagues and, and try to, I don't know, expand a bit the knowledge and the usage within uh, our, our community as well. I bring it back to the end users as well. Um, so I think really the, the fact that like, we have all these tags and we try to cover so many different areas, it's, uh, it's really uh, a good opportunity. Like anyone joining the TOC, this will definitely be a, a big uh, plus. Yeah. The thing that I'll say is that I think I was quite surprised that every single TOC member is human. I had this like perception that like everybody on the TOC was just this like wizard that knew every element of everything there was across the entire cloud native landscape that we showed. And no, collectively we have pretty good coverage of it, but not a single individual understands all of that. And so um, that, that I think was a little surprising to me and delightfully surprising. Cool, we can now open it up to the floor for uh, questions from the audience. So, oh, that's, uh, that's quite a lot of hands. So I'll just, I'll pass it over to you first. Hi, thank you. Um, when I joined the mailing list, I was kind of at the beginning overwhelmed by all the voting and NBs and Bs. Like, how do you keep track of those? I mean, I had to look up what they mean at, because I was a plus one B, plus one MB. Maybe you can Amy. go a little bit Amy. into that. Amy. Col Amy. Yeah, culturally, we, so the, the, the answer is Amy, but we have staff that you know essentially facilitates all kind of the process stuff. Um, we're all about you know public voting and public responses. You know, there's been times where I would say by the time something gets to a vote, there's a lot of consensus built, but we do allow community members to essentially also vote. But TOC members are the ones that have binding uh, you know votes at the end of the day. Now that I think about it is from an external perspective, if you just join that list and you're seeing like plus one and Bs fly by or you know, like maybe we need to kind of document that and make that a little bit more um, transparent of what these things mean because that's kind of this, this language that we've kind of codified um, you know, uh, on our own, obviously inspired from the uh, Apache Foundation and so on, um, you know, how, how they vote. But. And I would encourage everybody to, if you're interested in a topic and you want to cast a vote, please do. Um, because we as that's something that we actually depend on as a technical oversight committee um, is that is one of the ways that we get the pulse of what you all, what the the community as a whole. Because by the time it goes to vote, we've we've had we ha we've had discussion internally within the TOC publicly. Um, we the the tags have done some due diligence. The projects have done some due diligence. There has been a an open call for comments on the incubation proposal, for example. So that's one ability, one way for the, the broader community to have input. But then when it comes to that final vote, we all, I'm sure you do as well, we, that's, that's definitely a bit of a pulse. Yeah. Um, so yeah, not, not only helps. like even the number of votes you see there, it kind of shows momentum. Yeah. Yeah. Next question. Well, there's lots of, uh, I'll go to you. <laughs> so um, the landscape, of course, 
gets a lot of jokes and laughs. But I actually like it a lot. And Thank when you. I, yeah. <laughs> but when I look at it, though, it's, it's really just trying to define the projects around the operating system, if you may, right? So it's sort of centralized. So my question to you is, have you ever looked at in the, on the outside of this? So for instance, one obvious one would be the verticals. So different verticals like banking, retail, you know, uh, energy, da, 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 right? They're all using this thing. So essentially trying to invite projects from those verticals. And then the other part, which would be closer to, I'm sure what you're doing and what I did in the past, more like researchy stuff. Uh, so that would get into your security, but specifically for instance, crypto, right? Uh, defining a cube coin or some kind of a crypto uh, a project that people inside the landscape in the middle could start experimenting with. And that could help with the future stuff. The, the way the kind of Linux foundation works is generally it is a foundation of foundations, right? So CNCF is one. We have our own like little landscape. You know, I, I don't know if many people know about this, but there's a website called landscapes.dev, right? If you go there, we actually have a lot of different other landscapes for different organizations. So like the GraphQL Foundation has a landscape. Hyperledger has a landscape. Finos, which is the FinTech Open Source Foundation of the Lindsay, has a landscape. LFAI Foundation has a landscape. So there's a lot of different landscapes. There's actually ones that have been built by external folks that want to do this. So if there was another community out there that wanted to go take advantage of the technology and so on that we've built, they could go build um, their, their own landscape. I mean, that whole project really came um, out of, you know, the late Dan Khan and I just tracking all this crap in spreadsheets and kind of got sick of it and making a joke one day, like, what happens if we open sources and make the community do it for us? Uh, and it kind of worked out at the end of the at the end of the day. But the code is all open source and available for anyone to to take and take and play with. We got a few so more maybe, minutes. It, maybe also for the navigation of the landscape, there there are some efforts to try to guide end users through it. This cartographers uh, working group, and this is some this there there are efforts to to try to help out with uh, navigating. Yep. Cool. We got a question. Oh, um, we're actually we're actually at time right now. Okay. Um, can so we take this one more? We can take we can take three oh, okay, times. Okay. Okay. It's all right with everyone. <laughs> no, that's so good. Ask I don't think question. An executive decision. We're going to make time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you for taking my question, and <laughs> yeah, we can still make the event. So I'm Yuan Chen yep. from Apple. So my question was, yeah, I, I'm a Kubernetes contributor and mainly in the SIG scheduling, SIG scalability. As we are now developing more advanced features, it often requires uh, collaboration, coordination across the SIG or different wor working groups. Even sometimes like uh, we are have some batch support, for example, Spark in Kubernetes, they talk to the Spark community. So I just wondering how do the C, uh, the TOC and the working with the C group or working group, even cross the community, can really coordinate and help the collaboration and across the different and the, yeah, interest group, work group, community collaboration, because I think that's probably is very important. I, I think I mean, it's, it's hard, like, I think the, the, the TOC going from like, let's call it like a top-down perspective of trying to force that oh, woo -woo, time, to force that collaboration, it, it, it's hard. Generally, it, it germinates from like a bottoms up thing and like a concrete example I could give you is, you know, we have a project now called Open Telemetry, right? And uh, in the early days, there was, before the Open Telemetry days, there was Open Census, there was Open Tracing, which part of CNCF, and there was just an incredible amount of like confusion and conflict. And I think one day, um, uh, Brian Cantrell, who is a, a you know older TOC member, just got you know f like livid and you know pissed about this thing, and people were approaching us. Can you help us? Can you help bridge these two communities together? We held meetings. We had TOC members kind of bridge the and kind of help collaboration. And, and open telemetry was born, and I think the world is is better for it. But generally, these things kind of happen from enough people showing up and making requests of the TOC, and they'll kind of kind of guide and you know deal with that. But it has to come from you know the communities um, you know, themselves. We'll bring people together and do our best to, uh, to, to resolve things. But yeah, case by case basis is the best I can uh, answer for you. I don't know if anyone else has any uh, comments on, on this one. Otherwise, you wanna enforce, you wanna be the time? I, know, I just realized Call. we don't have anything next, yeah. so. Call the time. <laughs> okay, 
Uh, well, thank you everyone for coming today, and can I get a big round of applause here uh, for our wonderful speakers?